And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand. We've agreed with Eric that you can uh, interrupt, raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, but there will be also a Q&A session at the end, so you can also post your questions uh, on the chat and uh, we can try to also interrupt and read them or we can ask the questions at the end. Uh, before we proceed, uh, we would also like to announce uh, our future events. So uh, on next uh, Saturday, Dr. Li Wen Shi will give a talk, uh, QA and HPC on the quest of quantum <coughs> AI optimized HPC. Uh, then in May, uh, Dr. Bruna Araujo will tell us about moving towards compactification of the many body wave function using a bottom up approach. Uh, later in May, Dr. Edo Giusto will tell about quantum uh, reliability, uh, circuit susceptibility faults, and integration issues. Uh, then in June, Dr. Siwa Niu will tell um, about uh, practical quantum computing, others in crosstalk and uh, uh, circuit optimization. And then um, on 22nd of June, Elliot Miller uh, will give a talk uh, related to AI and maybe also quantum machine learning. Deep learning generalization, novel methods for ensuring AI can be trusted. And finally, in July, Zeki Seskil will tell about uh, education in quantum computing, educating to the culture of quantum technologies, a survey study of concepts for public awareness. And finally, we would like to thank our partners and uh, sponsors. Uh, as you can see, there are several uh, organization, organizations supporting us. So we thank all of them. And uh, yeah, I think uh, this is all from my side. So. Eric, if you are ready, uh, the Zoom yes, is I'm yours. Ready. And... Hello. Yes, yes. So first of all, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's our pleasure to have you with us, and uh, you can start sharing your slides if you have some slides, of course. Uh, okay. I I would like my screen to be shared. Okay. There is a green button. Oh. That's one way to do it. All right, I can see our screen. Yeah, oh gosh. I have that banner on top. Oh, okay. Thank you, Helen Ma and companies for inviting me to this lecture. My slides are complicated. And they have a dual purpose. So uh, therefore also looking at afterwards. Uh, so follow my mouse and there are places to link on it. Uh, there are page numbers on the bottom of the screen that uh, I hope you can see. Yeah, there it is. Uh, my uh, take on quantum mechanics is by history, theory, and experiment. Uh, there's all this history is in another lecture set of slides that you can just click on here. I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, what's most interesting is that Planck had a second theory and the translation is something I did that is in my, on my website for you to see. Uh, my work is an extension of Planck's second theory. And so it, there are arguments for and against quantum mechanics is really what the history of quantum mechanics is. And, and also there's my website threshold model that uh, you can find right here. Uh, so Einstein had a model of quantum mechanics of the photon that uh, I'm going to take the time to read. It's one of the better explanations. It's in a book by Bohr, uh, Atomic Physics and Human Knowledge. To the extent which renunciation of the visualization of atomic phenomena is imposed upon us by the impossibility of their subdivision 
is strikingly illustrated by the following example to which Einstein very early called attention and often has reverted. If a semi-reflecting mirror is placed in the way of a photon, leaving two possibilities for its direction of propagation, the photon may either be recorded on one and only one of two photographic plates situated at great distances in the two directions in question, or else we may, by replacing the plates by mirrors, observe effects exhibiting an interference between the two reflected wave trains. In any attempt of a pictorial representation of the behavior of the photon, we would thus meet with the difficulty to be obliged to say on the one hand that the photon always chooses one of the two ways, and on the other hand, that it behaves as if it passed both ways. So here's the picture of uh, what he was talking about. This is a model. The photon is a model. It's not a thing. And this is the model that whatever starts out with, they say is quantized to Planck's constant times frequency. I agree with that. I, I embrace H nu, energy equals H nu. But it has this model where the H nu would show up one place or the other, but not both. This is a one particle kind of entanglement that is claimed to exist by other people's theory and experiment. The other part of the photon model, and also it's the model of quantum mechanics, this works for all of such ideas, electrons, protons, neutrons, that it has both parts. That there's a probability wave that goes both ways and it guides the particle to a many particles, many such that it would accumulate to an interference pattern. And I expect that you all really know this, but I'm saying, spoiler alert, I'm going to show that this part of the model of the photon is what fails, the particle part, by experiments I'm going to show you. So back to Planck, we all know about Planck's uh, first theory, of quantized absorption and quantized emission. But he had a second theory where if you look at the equations just in the beginning of, of uh, it's in a Dover book of the theory of heat radiation that I'm, I'm quoting here. But the same material is in his 1911 paper. So Planck's constant is in this inequality where it's a maximum, it's not quantized. So Planck had a threshold model. I call it a threshold model. Uh, in the history of physics, they had a few other ways of talking. In our textbooks, they'll call it the accumulation hypothesis or a, a loading theory. So Planck had, this is Planck's graph in, in uh, the book where he had continuous absorption and then emission was quantized. And this model was in his derivation of the black body uh, distribution, but it's not well known that he had this, but it's very important because my, my work is an extension of this theory, but what I extend it to is that the absorption could be any path that it's arbitrarily shaped and then we all agree on quantized emission. And so I call this the threshold model. So it's important in the history of physics to realize that this idea of uh, absorption continuously or suddenly was treated ex even experimentally, uh, most notably by the element of time in the photoelectric effect it was also treated with the element of time in uh, the Compton effect. But here we're looking at how uh, Lawrence and Beams, Lawrence of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, uh, <coughs> E.O. Lawrence, uh, they did the experiment where there's this range of uh, times in the response of the photoelectric effect. But our textbooks say there's only this one or so nanoseconds response time. 
And they say that's the upper limit and that's the only time and it's just wrong. And you can look in these references and see how they say it wrong and then look here at the graph. And there are other reasons to extend the time and there are ways of seeing longer times. It doesn't have to be by the photon-like interpretation that they, they bungled it up on in the history of physics. It's in all of our textbooks. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the threshold model can explain these fast times and the longer times is what I'm getting at. So what is this threshold model? This little cartoon I do with uh, cups. So I'm saying that an H nu is emitted in the case of uh, gamma rays I'm, I'm dealing with here. And the detectors, there could be two, one in front of the other detector. And it's like filling cups where there's a partially loaded state that's hidden. You don't see it. We don't directly measure this partially loaded state. What we can see is if one emission can trigger two detections, a two for one effect. So when it fills to the top, then the cup can spill over. There could be a detected H nu in each detector. And we could see this in our experiments, but this uh, model, what it requires to see, it, it requires that we have pulse height resolution in our detectors to where we see that uh, what gets detected is a full H nu of energy. And then we do an, we can make an energy budget argument. And so, uh, and, and show that we're not counting half height pulses in this idea of where we get two for one. And of course, we embrace energy conservation and it comes out two for one because there's something there ahead of time. So we need this pulse height resolution, but if you look at the response, the pulse height graph of a photomultiplier tube or any sensor that reads the pulses in these low energy events, uh, they do not have pulse height resolution, even if you cool it with ni liquid nitrogen. But this is, this is the graph from uh, a uh, photomultiplier tube. And I've done this, by the way, to see that it, it works this way. And there is no pulse height resolution. They just say that it's a photon for all of these, and they assign an energy to it. And uh, there's, it's, it's a more complicated argument to go through this to see that if you were to eliminate these lower uh, height pulses, that it's not fair to the threshold model. And if you do the other way around, it's not fair to quantum mechanics either. But we do not have this problem with gamma rays. So this is the pulse height distribution of one of the gamma rays that I use. This is cadmium 109 gamma ray. Uh, it's photo peak, which is this section, emitting 88 keV from a sodium iodide scintillator. The 88 keV is, in my view, what I'm trying to explain, it's not the energy of the light, it's the energy of detection. There is such a thing as an energy, but it's in the detection the way it works and responds. The pulse height is proportional to the electromagnetic frequency and the H nu energy of detection. That's on the horizontal. The vertical is how many. And so we're able to uh, look at these pulses and see this uh, energy budget that I mentioned. So when other people do this, they, it's set up very similar to uh, Einstein's model of the photon. And they go through great pains to make the argument that they're emitting one at a time. With, they, they just, they do a lot to do that, but it still has problems with the detector. And for whatever reason, it comes out like this, where the pulses, are not together in time. It looks like what shows up goes one way 
or the other, that they're not coincident pulses to where it would line up. So if, it, if these two pulses coincide, if they overlap, it makes a great big peak in this histogram. The histogram is the difference in time between the pulses that show up from the two detectors. And this is actual data uh, from Klauser figure, Physical Review 1974. So I do the same experiment with gamma rays. I see this great big peak in the time difference histogram that refutes quantum mechanics. They're singly emitted gamma rays. I'm going to show you how that is determined. But one H nu is emitted per atomic decay. So this is from the nuclear physics laboratories where they analyze. These are the two uh, isotopes that I used, cadmium-109 and cobalt-57. The 88 keV from cadmium-109 decays to stable silver. It's stable. It doesn't get to emit again. One gamma ray at a time. It has a one at a time source. Same with cobalt-57. There are two pathways, but these are not in coincidence. So this is a 100. If you take this minus this, you get 122 keV gamma rays. And it de decays to stable iron 57. So let's look at the pulse height spectrum of uh, the cobalt 57 gamma ray. This is a logarithmic plot on the vertical, pulse height on the horizontal. And this is the photo peak. If this was in a linear scale, it would be this great big peak. And the further bigger pulses would hardly be seen. So you have to go to logarithmic to see this shelf here of pulse heights. So what are these? These happen when two of the big pulses, two of the pulses from the photoelectric effect response, the photo peak, happen together in time, they'll make a bigger pulse of light in the crystal sodium iodide scintillator to make a twice high pulse. So I calibrated this. This is, this is twice the uh, height at this position. And so we get to do a count of, of uh, these pulses. And we subtract background. So that's not what is happening here. You could see clearly that this shelf is not in the background. So what's usually done for these pileup uh, detections is to compare to chance. So we use the, the chance equation everybody agrees on and it's in the textbooks in nuclear physics. And it's the, uh, this, this peak rate squared times two and this time constant, which is uh, how big the flash of light is inside the scintillator. And so the books say it's about 300 nanoseconds or shorter. So you get some number and you compare to the rate that we read here, and it calculates out to six times chance. So right away, we're defining quantum mechanics just by looking at the spectra of this radioisotope's uh, gamma ray. Uh, so, and then, well, what's all this? This shelf, how do I explain this? I'm gonna explain it. These are, the Compton downshifted pulses. And you would think, oh, it, if it's a particle, it would just do this and kind of fade away afterwards. And I'm saying it's not quite like that. I'm going to go to the next slide to show the, the deriv there, there's an alternate derivation of the Compton effect that you'll find in Compton's book. But I did and a, a rearrangement of the words around it to, to uh, have a picture that makes more sense as to what's going on. But still, you use Bragg diffraction and Doppler shift equations 
and you come up with the same equation for the Compton effect. And what I'm getting at is that if it's Bragg reflection, there's a non-deflective component that goes through that will then be able to interact with the photo peak pulses. So you get this pulse plus this pulse adds up to all of these. So I'm able to explain this spectrum. What I'm saying is do this, just do this simple spectrum and see what I call the unquantum effect, which is the refutation experimentally of quantum mechanics, because this shouldn't happen. You shouldn't get more than chance when you add up the single emitted at a time gamma rays from these two isotopes. So let me explain why this effect was not previously noticed. We're, we're looking here at the absorption of uh, our sodium iodide scintillator detector versus the electron volts of detection. And here are the two isotopes that I use for the most part. And we can see that the, the photoelectric effect response is greater is, is, is than, the, than the Compton effect response. Now, most radioisotopes are not here, that most gammas from the other radioisotopes are up here. And for instance, the CZ-137 gamma, and it's in textbooks where they take this gamma, they look at that sum peak I just showed you, the pileup peak, and you can calculate how many are there, and it comes out to chance. And so they think that it's just quantum mechanics, everything makes sense, but here it doesn't. And it's because there are only a few radioisotopes to use back here that, that, that have this property. They have to emit only one gamma per decay to see what I'm showing. It has to decay to a stable state, not emit another gamma ray. It has to have a reasonable half-life. And it's like a year is what I have for these. They have to have high photoelectric effect efficiency and our best detectors. And also, people are just not used to thinking this way, to wonder, well, what's wrong with quantum mechanics? So this is one of the better reasons why what I'm showing you has not been talked about before. So let's go back to the, uh, the beam split coincidence part of uh, the photon model, it's a coincidence test. And we're in this uh, matrix, I'm showing, well, who did what of these various forms of uh, these uh, coincidence tests? The beam split geometry has been done by visible light with visible light. With gamma rays, it's only me who's attempted such a thing. And also I'll show you work with alpha rays. The tandem uh, geometry, with uh, gamma and it is only that I'm, I'm the only one to attempt such a thing. This is called, formally it's called the true coincidence test, but I like calling it the test for one at a time. That's how I'm using it. And I'll explain that further. And everyone agrees on the way this test works and what it does. That it delivers what I showed you earlier uh, in the level diagrams that it emits one at a time. That's how they do it. They do it with this test. So here's the setup and the electronics of it. There are these pulse height filters where you're looking at the photo peak pulses, the characteristic gamma. So you, you count those pulse heights and you see, well, does it go in both directions at once, like a different gamma ray. If there were different uh, gamma rays emitted in coincidence from one isotope, and that happens very often, 
you can go in random directions and you'll pick it up here if it goes this way or that way or both or what. If it only goes to one or the other, it will be put together in this pulse uh, timing, the timing histogram, uh, the delta T histogram that I showed earlier, where they're not synchronized, it's just this band of noise that shows that the radioisotope emits one at a time. This is a much more reliable way to tell that your gamma ray, that your emitter is one H nu at a time, as I call it. Uh, and everyone agrees on how this test works. If it was to emit uh, in coincidence, there'd be this great big peak. And then they say the atom emits more than one at a time. But we're not using those kinds of atoms. So I do this test and I'm setting it up with uh, cadmium 109. And here's my delta T timing histogram, which is the band of noise. And we can calculate what's happening here, like how many are happening within this time window. And we'll put it into the chance equation. The two detector chance equation is very similar to the one detector chance equation. It's like this. There's the rate in the first detector times the rate in the se second detector times this time window. The time window that you choose for the chance equation is the same time that's used for counting how many show up in your experiment per second. And so you take the ratio of that experimental rate to the chance rate that I just calculated here, and we get one. That means chance. So this is a test of the chance equation. It works, we're getting one as it should be for this test. So we're, we're starting with the uh, one at a time test. We see chance, then we're gonna use the same radioisotope and rearrange the detectors either this way or this way. And then we'll see what happens. Do we read one at a time to see chance or do we see it two at a time? Like I showed you, it, it will come out like, it can come out like this. Not every radioisotope does it. I've done many where they were uh, what they call higher energy gammas and you do, you do not see this. And it's because of the efficiency in the detector for that gamma that has to be photoelectric effect uh, dominant. The unquantum effect is about the photoelectric effect. So, and then the other way of seeing after we do this test, somebody has to do the test. They do it in physics labs, so you can trust that they do it. And then just look at the uh, anomalous uh, pileup section of the spectrum and you can see whether you defy quantum mechanics or not. So this is another good test I do. This is, uh, I'm showing all the numbers on it, the chance equation and uh, subtracting uh, background. The background can be a significant fraction that has to be uh, done where you do the whole coincidence test with the radioisotope removed. And uh, so we get some rate we, and we compare, we count how many are in this peak. That's our time constant. The, the width of the peak is the time constant. How many happen over the time of the experiment? Total peak, uh, to, total, uh, this is how many pulses happen in that time. So it, it's done on this beautiful oscilloscope that lets you see everything at once. The uh, pulses will come out uh, to show, it's not in this graph though. This is the uh, pulse height histogram of each channel, the, the time histogram. This method of using the LaCroix oscilloscope is uh, what I figured out how to do. 
I use the, all the other methods in the textbooks, but found this is the best one. So this is a thin detector in front of the thick detector method. And uh, here's what the experiment looks like. Here's the thin detector. I don't have this anymore, it broke. Uh, it worked really great. So uh, there's a thin in front of the thick detector, the LaCroix oscilloscope. Here's this great big peak. And we're, I, I use these uh, professional nuclear instrumentation modules for the amplifiers, the uh, pulse height filters and timers. Uh, here's a miniature version of my way to split the alpha, by the way. Uh, Eric, uh, can we ask a question? Because there was, was a question on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, when you say chance, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean probability or something else? It's what could happen accidentally if two atoms were to create gamma rays overlapping in time within a preset time window. So you'll find this in the textbooks. Every, everybody uses this chance rate equation, they, but they use it they use it for the true coincidence test to tell whether something goes uh, to both detectors or not. If it goes to uh, both detectors, you compare the rate and see if it happens by the rate of chance as calculated here. Okay, thank you. I hope that it answers Good. the Alex question. Okay, I'm, we can go on. Mm -hmm. I have these videos that you can look at later where you can see all the steps that I go through to do the experiment. And then there's a, another quick video. So I, there are no secrets in what I do. I've been doing this since year 2001, uh, showing people my experiments. And I'm usually uh, ignored because <laughs> it's so controversial. Here's another nice experiment. Uh, the, the pulses are, are kind of hidden in here. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm showing the pulse height histograms and the timing histogram. Uh, this is from cadmium 109, 88 keV. I'm counting how many that happened in here. I'm doing the same chance equation. The, the, the rate that happens in the experiment goes into the into the, uh, the rate calculation. I subtract background. I get an experimental rate. Then I compare to chance. This is the only equation I use. Uh, these, there are two versions of the chance equation, depending on whether you use one detector or two. So you take the rate ratio of these two numbers and I calculate four times chance. Now, so that's the thing. Quantum mechanics says this should just be one, this number, and it's not. So this is the test. This is the way to see through the illusion of energy quantization. It's not quantized. Energy is thresholded by the electron. What I have is really a theory of the electron, and I'll show you more of that. Uh, and it's not just for light either that I'm talking about. So anyway, the way I put this together was with uh, a detector with a hole through it that is purchasable. And I had to make a special slug of lead with a hole in it to let the gamma rays go through just in one direction here to the second detector. And uh, it works pretty nicely. I gave the details of, of how to build this. There's several ways of doing the experiment. I'm, I'm gonna show you sev several of them. Um, this next one is a beam split geometry where there's a slab of germanium in front of a, a detector. And then some will reflect to go to the other detector and calculate everything the same way. You see this great big peak, which should not be there by quantum mechanics. You can just see it. You don't even need the numbers. You just look at the peak, how it stands above 
the wings and the histogram. The wings, the count rate in the wings of the histogram is the same as the chance calculation. So you could just count that, calculate that if you want. All the pulses are beautifully shaped that come out. The, you could see uh, the histogram is reproduced over here. So if it can split in two, you'd expect that it should be able to split into three or more, and it does. So I'm able to see this effect in the, in this case, it's, it's a triggered pulse height histogram where it has to go to both detectors to be in coincidence within a time window that's set for uh, determining that it's above chance. And then here, this pulse happened in coincidence with the other detector. So this is a two for one. This is a, a pile up where two, two of these had to make this twice big pulse height, twice big pulse. This is three for one, two here and one in the other detector. Here's slight evidence of four for one. Sodium iodide detectors, logarithmic vertical. It, it's important to use log to see this. So then I went and invested in these uh, high purity germanium detectors, HPGE, that require liquid nitrogen cooling to make them work. These are the best detectors. They have the highest uh, uh, resolution, the best resolution uh, to see the spectra. And so this is a pulse height spectra of just the one detector. And here's this beautiful delta function for the 88 keV gamma. And we can see there's uh, nothing to see here in, uh, as for the times two region. And both of these are linear. So this, this one is uh, in coincidence. So when you put it in coincidence to see what happens in this uh, pileup region, this uh, pileup peak lights up. And this is uh, three gamma rays have to happen overlapping in time. <coughs> this is the three for one effect that I showed you earlier over here as well. But it's with the other detector. So it's not a special case that I'm talking about among uh, isotopes or detectors. I've tried, I've done this many different ways. I did this way back in 2003, 2002. Here's another one. This is a complicated uh, picture, but this is, this, this is the important part. This is like what I was showing you before. This is the pulse height spectrum where it does two for one, three for one, four for one. This is with uh, cobalt 57, a different radioisotope from before, and different detectors, smaller detectors. I have it arranged at an angle. And uh, what did I get here? Five and a half times chance. That's great. Anything greater than one, and then seeing more than one at a time in the energy budget is the unquantum effect. So I've done this many different ways. Sodium iodide detectors, bismuth germinate detectors, cesium iodide scintillators. These are, these are scintillators. The uh, HPGE uh, <clears throat> pure germanium uh, detectors. The thing about the HPGE is that it does not have the high resolution uh, uh, of the, uh, I'm sorry, the high efficiency of the photoelectric effect uh, above the Compton effect is not as good. The, the sodium iodide, it turns out, is a better detector than what they think is the best detector. It's like where you see things the best 
by conventional ways that it has a, uh, a better resolution, it's not as good for the unquantum effect because of the way those uh, two mechanisms in the detector line up. But you can still see it, like I showed you with this detector. You can still see the unquantum effect. So I use these two isotopes I showed you. Americium has a smaller height gamma ray. It's harder to see the unquantum effect with it. Sodium-22 is very interesting, the test I did. It was a triple detector test because there was an extra gamma that I used as a trigger. Uh, I did manage to get cesium-137 to work, but uh, very poorly to work as an unquantum effect. There are many tests I did to eliminate artifact, wondering if uh, lead fluorescence was at play or if stimulated emission was going on. There was a test and a calculation I did. There are P photomultiplier echoes that show up. I even took a spark coil and just made all kinds of noise around my instrument to make sure there wasn't crosstalk going on. And then there was different ways of doing the electronics. Uh, these two uh, are more popular to do it with. And then I went to the LaCroix oscilloscope. Then <clears throat> the, these tests, functions of physical variables, they need more uh, repeating. I did see the effect, but I'm hesitant to uh, show them off, at least not here. But I saw evidence of uh, magnetic fields on the scatterer and uh, angles uh, from the, uh, uh, the splitting. Uh, uh, there's the chemistry of the source where I, I used uh, metal and crystalline that had changed the ratio, of the, the degree above chance, functions of distance. I saw all these effects and I expect other people in the future to keep working on it and figure out, well, what's going on? How do we use this effect? but I set it up to, to show you how to do it. It's in my write-up uh, that I call Photon Violation Spectroscopy, where I explain how to do all these tests. So <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna go, unless there are any questions about uh, the gamma ray uh, experiments, uh, I'm gonna go to, uh, well, atoms and rest mass. So <clears throat> what about rest mass? It's been known since 1930 that atoms diffract. This is a really beautiful recent test where helium will in, in, encounter a concentric circle diffraction grating and it can focus the helium like waves. So in, in the uh, result pattern, here's how it focuses to this point. And the authors talk about it, that this is the wave effect. And over here, where it goes straight through, these are the particle components. So this experiment shows that there are two states of the atom, that it, the atom is a soliton. It could either be hold itself, hold itself together as a particle or lose that ability to hold itself together and show itself as a wave. However, this can still be interpreted as a probability wave. We're not making the distinction between quantum mechanics and the threshold model yet in this experiment. It's just pointing out the wave particle duality, but it is pointing out the soliton property. Can I have questions? Yes. Wave properties of uh, atoms for a long time. And I'm saying, let's look at it. And I do it with this experiment. So I'm doing the test of the particle property of quantum mechanics that it should go this way or that way at a beam splitter. And if you look at the tests that people do of this, like Aspe and Clauser, they talk about it this way. 
So we're going to see, does the atom go one way or another at a beam splitter? Uh, if it was to make half height pulses, we're up against this graph of what kind of energy does it take to split the atom? It takes seven MeV to go to two halves. Now we only have 5.5 MeV that's measurable from the decay of americium 241. So let's see what's going to happen. We get half high pulses, but it shouldn't split at all to do this, but it does. So this was 100 times chance. It's defying the binding energy prediction. And then here, the bigger pulses calculate out to six times chance. So all of this is a confrontation to conventional physics. No one else tried to see, does the atom split at a beam splitter? Well, I did it. And here's good results. Here's the uh, timing histogram. And I did the test of the true coincidence that came out as a band of noise. So look, I expect people to agonize over what I'm saying for a long time. But I have the evidence, I have the experiments for you to look at that nobody else has. And I also have a theory. So I did derivations of uh, these famous effects with a wave model that you can look at later and see how I connected the photoelectric equation to the de Broglie equation. But we still have these little M's and H's and E's that look like particles in our equations of these effects. So this is really the problem, how to explain wave particle duality with uh, like electron and proton kind of an atom diffraction. How does one explain that? Is it, a, is it a ghost wave that people talk about? I mean, the alternative to what I'm saying is a, is a whole list of uh, many worlds and it's all connected by super determinism or pilot waves or we're in a computer simulation. I'm the conservative one here saying it's not all this weirdness. There's a way to see it. I'm showing you how to see it, please. So <clears throat> this is really the problem. And this was just as important as the experiments to realize what I'm showing next. If you look at the equations of the effects that are famous for the wave properties, the message of the experiment is to have ratios of our great physical constants in the equation. The, the message of the experiment, in this case, like if you do an electron diffraction experiment, you have an H to M ratio. All I'm doing over here is to uh, <clears throat> just write the ratio as a Q, H to M ratio, to emphasize that it's the message of experiment is to give you the ratio and it's very easy to go and say, oh, the M came from another experiment and so on. But if you look more at my writings, you'll see that there's, there are assumptions going on where like the charge constant was taken from an ensemble of, of charges like in the Millikan oil drop experiment. And then they assume that charge is always quantized as by that experiment in free space. Well, I'm saying it's thresholded charge. So to really understand how to do the resolution of wave particle duality, it requires going back to other experiments and seeing, well, is there another way to interpret it? Are there false assumptions running around? I'm pointing them out. And then you end up with this beautiful symmetry 
of ratios that let you see, well, what would happen in, in an electron that was to emit and then spread all over the place? If you were to take a cubic volume of the charge wave and say, well, how much mass would be in there and how much charge? It would be a conserved ratio of charge to mass. You wouldn't see the whole E and the whole M. So I'm saying, if you see wave effects, it really is a wave. It's not a particle or some quantum mechanical way of assigning one to the other or whatever you want to try to put words around it. It's, it can be something simply understandable as the wave is a physical wave. With this property of conserved ratios, what can happen is the absorber can pick that ratio up, its identity, the identity of the kind of wave it is, is transmitted by the ratios. That's really the resolution of wave particle duality. And the experiments that I point out go along with it to show that it's not quantized, it's thresholded, and things can smear out and show itself in this two or three or four for one manner that I've demonstrated. And then there's this thing that I think you'll all recognize, and I'm, I'm posing it as a question. Do the Bell hidden variable equations or theories include the idea of a preloaded state in the detector, like I've been talking about. Do they include that? I don't think it does. When I read those papers, it does not look like they're talking about a hidden variable in the preloaded state. <coughs> they're talking about a hidden variable in whatever shows up the particle to make what it looks like. So what what it looks like to me is that Bell is just wrong. It's missing that property. In this case, the curve is quantum mechanics and the experiment. In this case, and in many cases, quantum mechanics gets it right. But since people say quantum mechanics has this non-local property and they think Bell is local, they think quantum mechanics says the world is non-local. And I'm saying the problem is in Bell. In, and and uh, I'm saying to look at the equations and see if I'm true, if I'm uh, right about that. But in conclusion, there are these assumptions that I, I can point out or I have pointed out. It'll be in the history lecture, or you can just see them here. And <clears throat> this. What I'm getting at is that there is such a thing as a preloaded state. I showed it experimentally, and my theories came up with a good way to justify it. The theory and the experiment complement each other. I did the theory first, by the way, and then knew what to do for the experiments. I did have some help from my friend Ken, who guided me to gamma rays. So. In conclusion, I'm saying there is no entanglement. There are no photons. The photon is a model. I show how the model breaks down the particle property of the model. And, and H nu is not a photon. It's just an H nu of initially emitted energy and detected energy. Atoms are two-state solitons. Nature is local and real. The weirdness stops with me. And then I'm saying, please, uh, there's all this nice history to see. The, the good thing about this uh, lecture, this other lecture slides that you can read about, is that you don't have to believe me. I put in the original off prints, what was done here. I'll take more questions. 
Okay, thank you, Eric. We have some uh, other questions uh, on the chat, so uh, let me ask them. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so there's another question from Alex on YouTube, just to understand more. So you've mentioned that many quantum mechanics experiments claim the issue that photons uh, one at a time, but how exactly your experiments are different? Uh, you are doing same thing, isn't it? I'm doing a very similar experiment with gamma rays instead of visible light. The one at a time property has been tested with visible light. No one else tested it with gamma rays. I test it with gamma rays, the same test, and I see the opposite answer. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, there was another question from Dev. What about the Bose-Einstein condensation? Has been verified by experimentally. What is superfluid helium? I I'm not I'm not that uh, uh, privileged to know all these different okay. theories that somebody can throw at me. That that's really uh, not it's not fair. It's holding me to a, a un, unfair level. I, I'd have to look at that ahead of time. Okay. All right. But, but there you. is there is something about the low temperature physics that I can mm -hmm. comment on that. Uh, it, it uses Planck's second theory. It, there's an extra H bar over two that comes out in this theory that's used in, in the uh, low temperature physics. Okay, good. Uh, there's another question from Dev, but uh, I'm also not sure if it's related to the scope of this talk. Dev, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask if you want. I'm not sure if Dev is still with us. If not, then we can well escape it. Uh, all right, do we have more questions to Eric? There are a few friends of mine who may be out there in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, is Dave Chapman out there? <laughs> yes, Dave is here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm here. So... I guess the big question with the threshold model right now is, do you have an experimental way of measuring the threshold state of a, a given piece of metal or other material? No, I measure the, the uh, gamma rays that come out after a split. I don't, uh, we're, we're still assuming that the emissions are quantized. That's the threshold right. state. The threshold state is that Planck's constant times frequency is true. There, yeah. there is a discontinuity. And it, it, that discontinuity indicates the threshold state. So the issue, the, the body of my work is about distinguishing between some kind of continuous absorption and a quantized absorption to say that nature is not fully quantized it's only quantized on emission and to to do my tests and also to analyze other people's element of time in the photoelectric effect and the compton effect to reanalyze these tests you it's it's uh, demonstrated i demonstrated that uh, quantized well, absorption as a problem historically it was a lot easier to measure the quantized emissions and that's, you know, that was the case that Einstein analyzed a hundred something years ago. Um, but to the degree that we can perform a, uh, a measurement of the state after a, uh, an absorption process, I think that would be useful. That was what? I think it would be useful to be able to measure the absorption process. And then also, um, you said that there was difficulties with the detector technology for visible, which is, you know, between basically one and 10 electron volts. And here we are with the hundreds of KEV. Do we have any way of doing this sort of experiment with um, x-rays in like the 10 to uh, 10 to 20 
JEV range. Yeah, it could be done the same way I did it with gamma rays. The problem is uh, an X-ray tube will most likely not work. There'd be a flood of too many going on. You'd have to use a radioisotope that emits an X-ray, use a low temperature uh, detector for the X-rays, and yes, the experiment could be done with X-rays. Okay. Well, there, there are many variations that I'm setting you up for. That's like that's an great. obvious good idea. Let's see if yeah. we can do the unquantum effect with X-rays. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Those, those are my questions here. Yeah. Let's see. I'm wondering if Marco is out there. <laughs> there are a few friends of mine who I've worked with that I'm calling upon. And so, and if, if anyone has seen my work, I'd, I'd like for them to say hello as well. Because I, I don't know who's out there. I don't see Marco um, among the audience. So actually there's one more. So uh, so it's rather a comment and not a question from Alex. Yeah. So this this is this is what Alex uh, said on YouTube. Uh, my own problem with things like Bell's experiment and others, the fundamental questions about the light polarization and single photon particle flying into the detector. So this is rather just a comment, but uh, I I don't know what to say. I I didn't quite yeah. understand. Yeah. Uh, me too, to be honest. I'm not sure. So maybe uh, it was related to another um, another answer, but uh, I'm not sure. Maybe Alex can clarify. Or maybe he can join our Zoom to unmute and, and ask if it's possible. I'm not sure if he can join us, but... All right, do we have more questions to, to Eric? Hi, this is Riza Rasul. Eric, I'm, mm -hmm. I am persuaded by your, your argument that um, uh, uh, there is a physicality and that uh, reality is, is local. Um, uh, I think the challenge you have is really communicating the, uh, the theory uh, to the world. This is not, I think this is fantastic and brave work that you're doing to um, explore the hocus pocus <laughs> frankly. I think most of us studied physics um, and came away with an unease that what our professors told us was really hocus pocus. Um, and um, I, I applaud you in in, in this work. I, I, I did read um, uh, one of your articles a while back and I'm persuaded by it. Um, so how, how, how do we, how do we um, probe this even further um, you know your your last diagram about um, the half um, uh, the alpha particles diagram, where where it's you show the cluster of um, half energy alpha particles. These aren't half a, th 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 that cluster. Yes, that one. So maybe you can talk a bit more about that and how how can we probe that even further and and understand its meaning. That's good. It's very important. This is very hard to do, by the way. I, I rebuilt the experiment, the whole vacuum chamber, four times, different detectors, different spacings, different foils to uh, reflect off of, different kinds of foils, different thicknesses. So this was a lot of work. And also uh, doing the programming of the LaCroix to generate this graph. Uh, <clears throat> right. I, I expect people to be agonizing over this and reproducing it for a long time. And what other things will split the same way? Uh, the alpha is thought to be the most kind of stable uh, particle or soliton. Uh, so there are plenty of other things to try to do it with to decay, maybe uh, do an electron split. Uh, it's harder to do. It is, it's uh, more expensive detectors. This was easy for me to do in a way, because I was able to get the americium-241 from a smoke detector, and I was able to buy the uh, alpha ray detectors uh, off of uh, eBay. Most everything I did is from eBay. 
and uh, I'm fortunate enough to to have enough resources and talents to do this kind of thing. But sure, there's plenty more that can be done. I mean, just leaving this on a longer time. Uh, how how many hours did I did I I didn't mark down how long I did this test, but it was several. Well, it's also probing the threshold. I mean, at how low can you go in energy before this phenomenon stops happening? And that might give you an understanding of what that threshold, where that threshold comes from. Is that threshold some um, property of space-time itself? Um, is um, Are the forces, the sort of Maxwell's equations forces, um, uh, they, they, they exhibit some sort of behavior, whereas particles, the things we observe as particles, observe, uh, exhibit other behaviors. And is there that that threshold you're talking about? Is that the the the, the phase change that happens between um, forces and and particles? Look, I'm I'm, I'm spitballing here, but no. um, I think you're doing brave work. Thank you very much. Well, look. We're able to explore the pulse heights. That's what we have at hand. We're able to explore uh, energy of detection and time readily. So there's all combinations of using that. To see what happens before the threshold of detection, it's hidden. You need to be tricky to see this two for th or three for effect to know that it exists. We don't get to see pre-threshold levels. What, I, what you can see is smaller pulses down here in the, in the pulse height histogram. But what I found recently is the bigger pulses are much more interesting. That shows the multiplicity. So it, it looks to me that nature hides the preloaded state. That we don't get to see it readily. We have to use trickery of timing and combinations of of uh, pulses in detectors to see two or three to to see through the illusion of quantization I'm saying quantization is an illusion that's set up by the threshold and ratio properties those conserved ratios that I mentioned so if you have those two properties that that nature looks like in what I'm showing here with those two properties of nature, then you end up with a consistent understanding of all of our experiments in the past, plus the new experiments. You can analyze the past experiments with the threshold model and see that it still fits. I did some of that in my other writings. But yeah, you ask, how do you see the preloaded state? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm showing you how it is, this is how far I, I think is possible. I, I don't think it's possible to see the preloaded state, but we can see the evidence of it in what I'm showing that the ray that goes through after an initial detection, it goes through and can make more detections. So we know that there's something there ahead of time, just like in this... Uh, cup cartoon that I did. So uh, where'd that go? This thing. You're saying, well, how do we find that level? It looks hidden <laughs> unless you're tricky about it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you. There's uh, another interesting question from Brandon. Uh, have these results been exp experimentally verified in other labs? No. If so, no. Yeah, that's the problem. I'm asking for other people to do this. Look, it, uh, my friend Marco did make some progress in, in reproducing my effect, but I haven't heard from him in, in years. So what I'm saying to do is do this. I'm begging people to just go to the spectrum and see this effect that is straight away a confrontation to quantum mechanics the anomalous pulse height, the pileup of uh, those two radioisotopes. 
But yeah, I've been showing and telling people this for 20 years, asking people, there are no secrets from me. The, ask, showing people and telling them to do this. Well, I haven't heard, except from Marco. Marco did seem to reproduce it. This fellow, this friend of mine in Finland. And mm -hmm. there are videos of him on my YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are some further questions, actually. So uh, let me... Uh, first, there's a question from Ahmed. Can we see the inclusion page again? Which page is there? Uh, Ahmed, maybe you can unmute yourself and clarify because I'm also not sure. So in the meanwhile, I'll ask another question. It's uh, another question from Alex on YouTube. Uh, it is also not clear uh, is 241, 341, Four for one. It's not clear. Well, I did my best. Two for one is uh, is just seeing a peak in the histogram from a pair of detectors where it emits one, and then it has to get two to be coincident in time more often than chance. And when it does that, it makes a peak in the time histogram, which other people have used as tests of quantum mechanics. I'm, I'm playing by their rules. I showed you how Clauser did the same test to see if there was a peak. And, mm -hmm. and it was that he saw it obeyed quantum mechanics. It went to one or the other. And here I see pairs that go more often than chance. So the experiment is about comparing to the chance rate of getting two detections more often than what gets emitted, what you'd expect to be emitted one at a time. If it emits one at a time, what are the chances of getting two at a time? Well, you use this equation that everyone agrees on as, as to what the chance rate is, they use this in the true coincidence test, and they use it in some other uh, geometries as well with uh, massive particles in the telescope configuration. They use the chance equation. So mm -hmm. you take the rate in one detector, the rate in the other, and the time window. You get the chance rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another question on YouTube. Uh... Is this preloaded state kind of a background temperature? Um, yes. There, there be all forms of noise and other rays all over the spectrum that could contribute to a preloaded state that we do not see. That's how I see it. So, yeah, I expect that it would change with temperature. But it would be theoretical as to how that is done. I don't know how to see, like I said, the level of a preloaded state. Mm -hmm. So that, that for figuring that out, there's, there's more to be done on that mm -hmm. by other people. Okay. There's another question on YouTube. What do you mean by saying quantizing is an uh, illusion? Can you explain in details what you mean by that? Well... Let me go back to uh, Planck. Uh, well, if it was quantized absorption, there would be there would be no such thing as a preloaded state or any kind of continuous absorption. Mm -hmm. The quantization model excludes either of these models. So I'm okay. saying ex explore these models. Uh, theoretically, Planck did it. And I expect that if you look at other people who end up with quantization in their theory, that it's really quantized emission that they're going by and not making the distinction between quantized absorption and continuous absorption in many theories. But the way okay. to see the distinction 
is with my experiment where there would have to be such a preloaded state in order to get a two for one effect. Well, How else would you get two emitted, I'm sorry, two detected for one emitted? So that's my argument. There's okay. no other way, there's no other way to see that you would defy uh, quantum mechanics. I mean, there's no other way to see that you would get this two for one than to realize that there's something there ahead of time. So we, we embrace energy conservation. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope that answered it. I hope so. Uh, there's a question from Nathan. Uh, is there an implication that a certain number of particles not being detected in order to preload the detector and the detections you are observing are just those that push the detectors over the threshold. That's right. The there's there's a, a preloaded state that's lying there ahead of time. And what shows up with a classical pulse, it's this near field sudden pulse of electromagnetic radiation that I'm taking advantage of in these tests that pushes it over the, the threshold to see a, a quantized emission. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I answered okay. it. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, there's another question uh, from Alex. Regarding this two for one example uh, you just described, uh, your histogram has 25 nanoseconds resolution. It translates to approximately seven and a half meters traveled by the light. Don't you think the resolution is too low? No. There, look, it's a nanosecond per foot. And it's the difference in time that matters, not the amount of time it takes to travel across the experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, there's a question from Brandon. How are, how do we, uh, how are we mean to physically interpret what a preloaded state is? Where are those energy levels located? It's frequency levels. It's not energy. The energy levels mm -hmm. are H nu. The frequency mm -hmm. is conserved in between as it loads up. Okay. So it's really, it's, it's uh, important to understand that there are, such a thing as quantized frequencies. There are preset frequencies in the environment of an atom. Uh, by the way, this business of uh, difference frequencies and a theory of the electron was explored by Schrodinger in his first paper. So back in year 2000, just a little history, personal uh, note, uh, how I did this, uh, <clears throat> I had the idea, I knew that there was something going on with the loading theory or threshold model. I went back and looked through all of history to see, well, who explored this? It was, this, this was the, the, the first thing that came up were loading theories and threshold models. The history of physics, uh, it started with Lennard saying that there was a trigger hypothesis and Planck had a uh, thresholded action a threshold model. Uh, uh, Sommerfeld and Debye worked on it. And Millikan, in his test of the photoelectric effect, also uh, argued against quantum mechanics, but he knew that the equation worked. In, in Millikan's book, he understood the loading theory. In his early book, he understood it. In his later book, I think, I think I put it in here somewhere. So he had two books here. He abandons the loading theory. So he at least understood what a threshold model or loading theory would be, but he didn't understand how it could work. So he gave it up. So in my looking through all kinds of papers and following it up uh, in the history of physics, it looks like the last person to, to uh, explore the loading theory at all was Millikan in his papers on the photoelectric effect and in his book, uh, 
electrons plus and minus. So I don't know if I answered the question right. Okay, uh, let's see if we have some follow-up questions then. Can I ask a question? Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, the mm -hmm. first one, could you help me to understand what triggers the the, the preloading? That's the first question. And second question is, what are the implications of your finding in the real engineering world? Yeah, you can give up uh, any long range entanglement as far as trying to make quantum computers where you expect that to work. There might be a short range entanglement that has to do with the loading will happen and it'll make something happen discontinuously in the next molecule where the it's like a reverse uh, wave function collapse. It's a build up to a spot. So there may be some way to still do uh, computing based on this physics, but it's it's not a long range, a long distance range entanglement is what I'm disproving. And then what was the other part about seeing the trigger level? Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, pretty much how nature is put together, that nature shows itself with these thresholds. And it, it's like, well, arguing with God, is, is it really like that or not? Uh, so th that, that's what it looks like in all of our experiments. There are thresholds. We don't see, at least not directly, what the preloaded state would be. What triggers the uh, uh, discontinuity, yeah, it might, there may be a uh, level at the threshold where it will just sit there and then just take any kind of disturbance to emit, let's say, an electron in the photoelectric effect. So <clears throat> I'm not sure just what would happen on that. That's something that could be sorted out later. In what situations would a threshold be dormant and then show itself? Or when it just reaches the threshold level, does it automatically uh, make a uh, sudden change, like an emission of an electron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, there's a follow-up question or a comment uh, from Alex on YouTube. Okay, so just to clarify, you have the source emitting X particles per second in total, verified before, and then you have two detectors. Uh, QN expects detection rates x divided by 2 for both detectors or whatever. And you get something in total more than x, right? Uh, the x is like saying uh, times 2 effect, more than 1 effect. Uh, it's supposed to be just a one for one where uh, one detector should, should make a pulse and not the other. So that little x in, in many of my slides is saying, well, how many detections are there in response to a single single emission? Mm -hmm. All right. Where did I do that? Uh, here, the X thing. I think you're talking about that. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Right. This, the pileups that happen do not happen in the single spectrum. It's very important. I've seen that many times. Mm -hmm. And there is a, another follow-up from Alex. I'm talking about the, about the total number of particles emitted, not detected. Right. That, that's what the true coincidence test is about. That's, that's about how many are emitted. That's what's so beautiful about my argument. You do this test that everyone agrees on, that it emits one at a time, mm -hmm. except by accidental okay. chance. By accidental chance, you can get pairs. But this 
this histogram reads that. If there's more than chance, it makes a peak in the histogram. So from this test that all the nuclear physicists agree on as to how to make these energy level diagrams, they use this true coincidence test to do that. They use the pulse height spectrum and the true coincidence test to sort all this out. That's how we know we're emitting one at a time. Okay. All right. Okay. Do we have more questions to Eric? Okay. I don't see more questions on our chat. Uh, so I think we can conclude and finish. So Eric, uh, thank you once again for the presentation. Thanks for answering all the questions. So uh, there were there were many questions and the uh, discussion was uh, was interesting. So thanks for this. Uh, and we would also like to thank all the participants for their attention, for, for asking uh, the <clears throat> questions. May I ask a question at the very beginning? Yes. yes about the detection energy that you mentioned maybe an hour and a half ago, is it a matter of uh, the wave function collapse by measurement? Oh, let's see. The, I, I think what you're talking about is how do you know the pulse height is proportional to energy? And that that is done with a crystal diffraction of uh, x-rays and gamma rays where they'll, let me see if I can do this. <clears throat> You'll have a source and it'll go to a crystal and it'll diffract. And then you look at the angles So let's say this is the gamma ray. And then you take a, uh, a pulse detector, uh, like a sodium iodide scintillator, and you scan it across. And so then you're able to make the pulse height histogram. You'll know the relationship between the height, how big is the pulse, and the, and the angle. So that's how they do it. That's how... I think I follow this very well, but I believe... This is like in scattering experiments, it happens. But in all of this, this amounts to measurement. Because I detect the angle, as you say, and it's a matter of measurement, because that means that the quantum wave function, as in classical quantum mechanics, is collapsing once I do a measurement. Yeah. Well, we that's pretty much what we have is measurements. <laughs> so I I'm I'm a big believer in in the measurements. So <laughs> yeah, uh, physics is measurements. Yeah. It's not it's not dreams. Right, right. It's a good thing, measurements. Evidence. So we, we we agree on that. So it, all of this is about looking at many experiments and developing a consistent model uh, amongst all the ways of looking at those experiments. And so- Yeah, but it's difficult to measure Schrodinger's cat, alive or dead. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's- it... Once I measure, the, the cat is not there at all. That's using the model of quantum mechanics in your interpretation of the experiment. Just yes. start with what the experiment is saying, not people. So straight away, we know the relationship between the, uh, the angle gets, gets you using the speed of light and the diffraction of the crystal, uh, the, 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 the spacing of the atoms in, in the crystal structure then you get to know the frequency. The yeah, you convinced right, me right. and I have to give you a compliment of <laughs> tracing all these papers with experiments. And uh, it's very impressive. And thank you so much. I learned a lot from you. 
and I will repeat the, I revisit the recording to learn even more. Well, please. Thank you very much for opening thank you, my eyes. Sir. Thank you, sir. What's your name? My name is Itamar Halevi. I studied quantum mechanics by a Weizmann professor very long time ago who promised all of us to fail, but I got A++. <laughs> well, Just a minute. My name is Itamar. Yeah, okay. All right. I, I hope to communicate with you further. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you so much. So Eric, in the meanwhile, we've received uh, two other questions. Can yeah. we still ask them? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Joseph asked on YouTube, what, what kind of crystal? But you need this and all the rest is okay. Hello. Yeah. Can what I sit of... by you actually? <clears throat> I'm, it, I'm Itamar, sorry, I, I uh, Itamar could you please repeat? Crystal? Yes. What, what kind of crystal in the, there's a crystal in the detector and then there's this crystal for the diffractometer and I think it was bent quartz that, that was used. It was hard to do, but it's in books that show the relationship between pulse height and electromagnetic frequency with this experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And there's one more question. Has your experiment been tested with a cold neutron imaging instrument, such as a cold neutron time of light disk chopper spectrometer? This is a question of Jordan. Probably not. A cold what? Probably not. A cold neutron time of flight disk chopper no, spectrum. No, that's, no, that's way beyond me. <laughs> yeah, okay. That, that's I, what we supposed. I, I did all mm -hmm. this work at home. Mm -hmm. Just, just yeah. uh, from okay. used parts over the years. So my, my saving grace is that I keep working at it trying to see if there are any mistakes or problems. And uh, it's it's been holding up. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. OK, good. Thank you. All right. Uh, last chance to ask some questions. OK, we don't see more questions on our chat. So Eric, thank you once again. And we thank all the participants. And we hope to see you next time, next week. Thank you. Very Have good. a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.